Hello developers and architects and welcome to another video on building event driven systems. And to start today, I want you all to imagine something for me. I want you to imagine you've built the most perfect event driven system. You've got loosely coupled asynchronous systems. You've got messages flying around. Everything seems wonderful until it isn't. Until something breaks, until some big angry bug comes along and suddenly you have an outage. And now it's three o'clock in the morning and you're scrambling around trying to work out exactly what has gone wrong. Your page is blurring, you're up at your desk, bleary eyed, and you just can't work out what's happening. And that's because in event driven systems, cause and effect becomes really difficult. How do you work out what caused your system to trigger or potentially in this case, what didn't cause your system to trigger? Or maybe there's been a change in the schema of the event. How do you know that? How do you understand exactly what schemes are flying around? And this is where observability becomes one of the most important parts of building event driven systems. I mean, it's important in any system, right? You want to make sure you can understand what's going on. But in an event driven system, in an asynchronous system, it becomes even more important. And that's what you're going to learn about in this video today. You're going to learn about observability in asynchronous systems. Let's get into it. And to start with, let's actually talk about why things are slightly easier when you're building a synchronous system. So let's imagine you've got two systems that need to communicate. If you are prioritizing HTTP or gRPC or any of the other synchronous calls, when this system makes a call and this system responds, you've got data here flying over the network. And that data is going from point A to point B and then point B back to point A. This service knows exactly which service has called it because you've got this line of synchronous communication and you've got this line of response going back. So understanding cause and effect in a synchronous system is slightly easier. I mean, it can still be difficult, of course, but it's definitely easier than in an asynchronous system. If you consider this exact same scenario in an event-driven system, and this is exactly where you find yourself today trying to fix this bug in your event of an architect. You've got your two systems, of course, and then you've got this message channel in the middle. And as far as your service is concerned, your service that's broken over here, all you're doing is reacting to events that are coming onto this message channel. And this might be a point to point message channel. It might be a published subscribe message channel. There might be many other subscribers also interested in this. There might be only you. The point is though, you have no idea how messages got onto this message channel. And actually one of the fundamental things you will hear over and over again in an event driven system is that producer and consumer should have no idea that each other exist. And if that's the case, how do you understand exactly what is going on? What caused your system to trigger? How are upstream systems changing and developing? So what options do you have here? And first and foremost, I want to come back to the cloud events specification that you learned about in my last video. The cloud event specification gives you this defined spec for how you should structure all the events across your entire organization. You will include things like an event ID, the type of event, the source of the event, and really importantly, you should always include some kind of correlation ID. That might be an actual trace identifier. That might simply be just a correlation ID, something that allows you to link different systems together to follow a single request through all of your different systems. And as I talked about in that last video, there is actually a part of the cloud event specification that covers distributed tracing with the trace parent and the trace state properties. So the first thing to understand, and this is incredibly important people, please don't forget this one, is to include something in your events that allows you to implement distributed tracing, that allows you to determine cause and effect, that allows you to link a downstream system to an upstream system. Now, when it comes to actually linking these traces together, you have a couple of options here. The first of which is to create one long continuous trace. And I want to show you how that would work. And let's just imagine for the purpose of this, you've got system A over here and system B over here. And a request into system A is the request that your user makes. This is your front facing customer facing API endpoint. And when the and when the request hits this service, you're going to start a new trace up here. And that trace will be in play for as long as that request is being processed. Now, one of the options you have 
is that when you send the message onto the message channel, you include the trace ID as part of the message that you publish. Let's say that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then when your downstream service consumes this message, it has the potential now to continue this trace. So when this service here starts processing and starts generating spans for the different pieces of work that it's doing, you can actually relate all of these spans back to this original trace. So you have your spans up here for your upstream system. You maybe even have a span for the time that the message is in flight. And then you continue the trace down in the downstream system. And the only reason you can do this is because you've passed this trace ID, remember? So you need to propagate that context as part of the message that you pass. But this is the first option you have. You can create one continuous trace. This can cause you problems though sometimes. And I want to tell you a little story about a friend of mine, Martin Thwaites, who actually talks a lot about observability. And he gave me an example once upon a time about a system that he worked on. And it was an event sourced system. And at the end of every day, they needed to take all of the events that were processed during that day and run a kind of reconciliation against all of them events. Now, what this would lead you to if you implemented things in this scenario here, this trace here would end up being an almost 24 hour long trace. And that would mean all these little individual bits of processing for all the individual events would get kind of lost amongst this giant trace up at the top. So what other options do you have? So let's get back to the same scenario. Again, you've still got an upstream system. You've still got a synchronous request. And when this first request happens, you're still going to generate a trace up here. And you've still got all of your individual spans. The message still gets published onto the message channel and you still include your trace ID as part of this message. However, this time, when your downstream service consumes the message, it's just going to start its own trace and it's going to start its own spans and it's going to have all its own processing. Importantly though, when you start this first trace here, you're going to create what's called a span link and you're going to link this span here to this span here. So that means each independent service is its own independent trace, right? You've got one trace here, you've got one trace here, they'll have different trace IDs. This might be six, nine, seven, zero, one, two, and this is one, two, three, five, five, six, seven. You've got two completely independent traces, but you are telling your observability backend, wherever you're sending these traces, that these two traces are linked. And that is important. If you think about that same scenario I've just described, you've got your reconciliation job running down here, your batch processing, and each individual message you process in the batch, you're going to link it back to this top level trace. So you have the link back to the original processing that generated the message, but you don't end up with this giant 24 hour trace that overrides everything and makes everything kind of hard to work with. So there are two options you have when it comes to actually tracing data. The other really powerful thing you can do is actually be really intentional about how you tag your traces. Let's imagine the system you're working on here is a order processing system. And you get a customer that calls up and says, hey, I've got a problem. I can't find my order. I don't know where it is. And your support team look at it and they can't find it either. So they come to you as the developer and they want to know where has my message gone? If you had actually annotated your traces, so let's say in this top trace here, you annotated it with the customer ID and you annotated the trace with the order ID. And the same again down here, you annotated the customer ID and you annotated the order ID. In your observability system, whatever that is you choose to use, you can then actually go and search for all the traces related to a given order ID or related to a given customer ID. So that gives you that search ability, that ability to play detective, which is kind of fun, really. You get to go and be a detective and search for things, although maybe not so fun at three o'clock in the morning when you should be in bed. Yeah, maybe scratch the fun part. This gives you that ability, the potential to be able to ask the questions of your system that you didn't know you needed to ask. And that is the important thing to think about with observability and event-driven systems. How can I ask the questions that I didn't even know I needed to ask when I designed the system? So good tagging, thinking about how you actually link or continue your traces together. And there's one final thing I want to touch on actually, and that is around logging. Now, I think... For me, at least, tracing is the most important part of observability in event-driven systems. But 
you can use logs really intentionally as well. Let's come back to you now. You're sat at three o'clock in the morning trying to debug an issue with your event driven system. And you can see that the events are moving around, but actually the system you're working on, the downstream consumer, has started breaking, it started failing for some reason. And you spend an hour, two hours, three hours playing around, trying to work out exactly what it is that's going wrong. And eventually you realize that actually it was them guys upstream from you who've actually changed the schema of the event. And to understand that, You've actually had to go and change your login. You've had to actually add new login, redeploy your system, get the right observability in place. So one of the things that is really, really powerful to do is at the point you consume any message, let's say here, actually write a log of the actual event payload. So now in your observability backend, whatever that might be, you actually have a log of exactly what that request received. And if you link that log to the trace, you've now got a really nice debugging flow. Because if you know it's a specific order that's causing you a problem, you can go in and search for your order ID. And that order ID would give you these traces here and these traces here. And then you can see actually the logs that are linked to this trace message, because you've included your trace ID in your logs, you can see from the logs that actually this event payload is different to what you might accept. And you might pull out that event payload, take it off and run it through your tests and to see how that actually affects your system. And then what you actually realize is because you've got this long continuous trace, you look back up here and see that something's happened in the upstream system that isn't normal. There's been some kind of change or some kind of abnormality in that upstream system. You can then reach out to the developers of this system and work with them to fix the issue. And it gives you that ability to understand exactly what is happening in your system. You can understand where a given order ID is up to inside your system. You can understand how payloads change and how events develop over time. And finally, you can understand cause and effect, whether that is using trace links, linking your traces together, or that's using one big, long, continuous trace. Now, of course, there's options in there, and options always give you a place to make a decision. So the heuristic I like to use when I'm trying to decide, do I use a continuous trace? do I use span links, comes back to that idea of batch processing. If I've got an order processing system, I submit an order and it goes through five or six or seven different backend services in a single business process. Imagine an order comes in and when that order comes in, you need to check that the payment details are correct. You need to take the payment. You need to check the inventory details are correct and you need to make sure the delivery address is valid. I'm probably going to put them in a single trace because that is a single business workflow. I want to see that single individual business workflow together. Then when you start to think about the actual delivery of that order, let's say the delivery is going to take three days. Well, that interaction between your order processing service and your delivery service, that might then become a span link. So you might work these things together. You might have one big continuous trace for that initial business workflow, a separate continuous trace for your delivery workflow and then maybe some kind of span link in the middle to link them to independent business workflows together. So think about things from the perspective of your business and the business workflows that you have. And again, in my opinion, I would say a single business workflow should be a single continuous trace. If inside that order processing flow, I've got another service that's interested in orders, but it runs once an hour, once a day, and it does analytical work, it does reconciliation work, or maybe it's just a back-end process that's going to take a long time, I may well put that on a separate trace. Think about an e-commerce application. An order gets submitted, and once it's been submitted, it goes to the warehouse, and then it goes out for delivery, and it might take three or four days to be delivered. I'm probably going to break that into two separate traces. You've got your order processing trace that's the order actually being created and completed, and then I've got my actual delivery details happening separately. So it's a really, really strong case of it depends on your business case. And just come back to that question. If I had to understand exactly where this order is, what is the information that's going to be useful to me as a developer? Is it being able to understand the upstream systems that cause my system to run? Or is it something slightly more disconnected where I can understand that this batch process is running, this batch processing has processed 100 messages, and for each of them 100 messages, I can link back to the upstream service. So think about that question. How can I ask my system questions that I didn't know I needed to ask? So the most important thing to take away here is that idea of including some kind of trace information in the events that you publish. Because without that, you're not even going to be able to make a decision about whether you do continuous 
braces or a spam link. You need to have that data there in the first place. Build that data in from the start and you put yourself in an excellent position to be able to implement good observability going forward. As always, thank you all.